Robert Cumming from the West Coast, a conceptual photographer and artist. Uh, at least that's what you're called. Robert, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, let me see, I'm 33. Um, I just noticed about um, 50 or 60 gray hairs. <laughs> <laughs> Ten from this week, from this week alone, I think. Um, I'm from from the East Coast originally. Uh, spent uh, two years down in Champaign from about '65 to '67. Uh, got my first teaching job in Milwaukee, '67 uh, through '70, and then after that moved to California, uh, where where I've been since. Which uh, today, November '76. <laughs> In the mid-1990s at the Museum of Modern Art, which is where I got my first curatorial position really at any museum, starting off in the photography department. And when I first started, I would get, it, get to work early and I would go through all of the cylinder boxes, these black boxes that we had in cold storage, which were listed alphabetically. I found the work of this guy, Robert Cumming, who I'd never heard of before, which wasn't a big deal because I really didn't know that much about photography at the time. And it was like a picture of a, um, what to me looked like, like some artist had shoved the side of a sandwich into, an, into a, a, a melon. And I guess the first thing that struck me was like, what am I looking at here? Who is this artist? What is this weird object that he's created? And initially I thought it was kind of a joke. I thought it was funny. And I think one of the great appeals of Robert's work is that unlike a lot of conceptual art, which people associate with this kind of bland, cool intellectualism, he was very smart and he had a great sense of humor. So like there was a kind of pleasure that was delivered by his photographs that I felt was different from some of the other um, artists of his generation. Coming across his work first uh, for me came about when I was a, a student of photography and I think to this day students of photography find themselves split between a kind of very traditional idea of a kind of fine art photography and then another tradition that comes out of conceptual art that might be more ideas driven and not so interested in the fine print or the craft and Robert seemed to be right in the middle of all of that um, and that was a real eye-opener that you didn't you didn't have to separate picture making from ideas that they could all come together so he was a guy using an 8x10 camera having to take great, great care over every image that he made, but what he was making were these kind of strange, semi-sculptural, sometimes performative, sometimes very analytical things. And it makes you wonder whether they need to look like that or be shot on that camera or have that kind of feel to them, but they absolutely did to Robert. In the 70s, when I first knew him, was primarily known as a photographer. But knowing his work as well as I did, I was aware that he was painting, he was sculpting, he was photographing, he was um, setting up, creating scenes for photographs, he was doing performance art, he was writing a novel. Um, he was truly multifaceted, multi talented artist, artist. I think Robert to this day is a, a seriously under-recognized artist. He has received Guggenheim grants, he's shown in one person shows at the Hirshhorn and at the Art Institute. He explored every aspect of his creativity in a way that was taboo then, but it's now embraced. And in that sense, he is the precursor of, of a lot of a lot of artists of the 2020s. There was a very different world in Southern California when it came to art as opposed to New York City. 
I think what, what drew him specifically, what drew Robert specifically to Los Angeles was just this weird environment of Hollywood artifice and, and imagination and fantasy. One of the most salient aspects of, of Robert Cummings' work, as well as of William Wegman's, is they both spent time on the West Coast. And they were, um, or Robert was influenced by John Baldessari. If, if you think of Baldessari's throwing three balls in the air to try and form a straight line, and then works of Robert's of having balls fall all the, off the roof of a, a garage or a shed, six balls on the east side, two balls on the north side. Um, and there were, there were other artists like Ed Ruscha who combined image and text that I'm sure were kindred spirits and, and co-influencers with Robert. We never talked about anything. We just joked around and, and coexisted. Parallel play, they call it, with uh, children. So that's what we were, artist children, parallel playing. And we did very well together for many years without, uh, without doing like coffee house arguing about significance of what we were doing, just that. And that's quite wonderful, I think. What characterizes West Coast conceptual art as opposed to East Coast is a sense of humor. I mean, artists in California uh, didn't take themselves or their work too seriously, whereas in, in New York, everything appeared to be German-based. It was so serious. I mean, you can make serious pictures, and California people always did, you know, I mean, but you're living in an environment that's constantly reinventing itself. I mean, I love being in Los Angeles and I love driving around because it's like watching pictures all the time. It's like watching movies all the time. And you know, everything is constructed. There's not a seamlessness in terms of the environment and that kind of visual, what, agitation, friction, um, fun, right, of it is, is inescapable. I, I do think that the West Coast photographic and particularly the conceptual photographic tradition is really different. Um, one of the things I've always thought is that it has to do with humor. I think that there's a, there is a, a really interesting show to do and a history that links, you know, uh, certainly Baldessari and Ruscha, but even Bill Levitt, Joanne Callis, this, um, a, a kind of, a kind of humor that, um, I suppose is rooted in the absurdity at a certain point in time of being an artist on the West Coast. This, you know, where it's just like wide open, like, what are you doing? Hollywood dominates everything. You know, artists are practicing here in the 60s and really inventing an art world for the first time. Having come from the East Coast and having come from places, you know, from Massachusetts where a lot of the architecture there is, is is older than California, and buildings are hundreds of years old rather than maybe if a hundred years old in, in Los Angeles, say. He saw how the architecture in Los Angeles was trying sometimes to look like something that it wasn't. Just like on a film set, it's, you're creating a world that is completely artificial. So Robert used to teach at several different schools around Southern California and there was a big commute to get from one to the next. To time it and miss the traffic jams, he, he found that he could hang out in Hollywood. He ended up going to this one particular film used bookstore in the center of Hollywood that had boxes and boxes of these 8 by 10 what are called continuity stills that uh, film studios used to use way back in the early, you know, mid 20th century to record continuity between scenes when they're making movies. It's interesting, in, in, if you say the word studio in most places, people will think of artists. If you say it in California, the first point of reference is cinema. 
you know, the movie studio. In the 1960s and early 70s, a lot of the, um, the kind of ephemera of cinema, film stills, continuity stills, um, were dumped by the studios and you could, you could pick them up in, you know, secondhand bookstores and movie memorabilia stores. And many, many artists uh, in California, but not only, got really interested in those. What fascinated him was that there, these were like manufactured worlds that he was, that the pictures were being taken of. And so this sort of sparked an idea in, in him about creating his own kind of film set in front of the camera. Now that we live with surveillance video doorbells and everybody's like worried about who's coming into their backyard and like how are you going to flash a light on the person who's going to steal your Amazon package, looking at Cummings' picture now is really, it was, it's, it's interesting. It's fun to look at them again because there's something both very, seems like there's something naive at work, it's kind of like this faux, uh, Oh, ah, uh, shucks, you know, we're making, we're making a movie in our backyard kind of thing. And on the other hand, those spotlights are weird and that darkness around them. So it's not unlike being in Los Angeles and, at night and having police helicopters flying over your house, right? It's got that quality to it too. So there's the humor in it, but there's, a, there's like the edge of scariness to it. There's a weird, it's really under the surface kind of sexiness in the work every once in a while. Um, so the work's complicated, which is part of what's fun about looking at it, and, and it's part of why you keep looking at it. It's, it's, not, it's not about jokes, it's not about one-liners, it's about how meaning gets made. And if you're at all interested in it, you get drawn into it. The work is actually very disciplined. Like, everything about the work is very, very well crafted. It's well thought out. He used to do a lot of drawings, preparatory drawings ahead of doing the photographs. So it's this funny combination of like the effect, which is funny and strange, but they were so controlled. They were so disciplined. And he was also an amazing printer. So he would follow the concept through from the very beginning, which is like sketching out this idea on a little piece of paper, all the way through the fabrication of the objects, the stage set that he would then create, often at night. And I think another interesting thing about his work is like, how many artists do you know of that generation were making pictures at night? I mean, it was just one of those many things that kind of distinguished him all the way into the printing of the work, which had this, I mean, those, those were just beautiful, like silver saturated prints on fiber paper. So like he was totally in control of every step of the way, but the work comes off as having this free spirit and exuberance that is like two, I think two sides of his character. I mean, I think of him as an artist, but also as a kind of scientist philosopher somehow that he's interested in how things are made, how things are put together, and that those are very, very physical experiences. Um, and they have a, they are sensual experiences and they are aesthetic experiences. You're kind of stuck in a way, you're not really sure when you're, when you're reading it, whether it is humor or whether it is tragedy, you're, you're, you, you reach an impasse. I don't, I don't like joke art. You know, I don't do it, I don't do it to be funny. Uh, I think a lot underneath the, the humor is, um, it's about perceptions, different kinds of perceptions, and that's, that's mainly what I'm after.
In the last few years of his life, Robert returned to his photography and decided he was going to define a body, quite a large body of work that could be printed at a larger scale than he had done in the past. So throughout the 70s and the 80s, um, the 8x10 photographs were only ever contact printed so that your final print is the same size as the negative. In an 8x10 inch negative, there's extraordinary potential for enlargement with no loss of quality. In enlarging those images, you can, you can just see more. You can enter into the universe of these pictures the way perhaps you couldn't when they were these jewel-like 8x10 pictures. So, the large print project was born and some of those have been exhibited and people love them. They feel like a kind of natural extension of, of the work and it was great that Robert was around to do it. To me, that's just a really great opportunity to sort of introduce the work to a new generation of, you know, art viewers, um, for people who hadn't seen it and, and sort of, you know, help the art audience kind of understand the sort of historical lineage of the sort of contemporary conceptual uses of the medium and sort of where that comes from. Basically, he had blueprints for the work, but he, they weren't realized from a production and conceptual standpoint, I think it's, you know, it's part of the sort of DNA of younger artists to sort of think that way. And, you know, this just illustrates, again, his sort of progressive thinking about the medium in the 70s, even though there wasn't sort of a viable opportunity to sort of make the work the scale that he wanted it to be. It's time for people to be looking at the work again and a lot because I think we're living in a visual culture now where with everything from Photoshop to artificial intelligence and misinformation, we look at photographs really, really differently now. We're, we're much more visually literate, confident, um, less nervous around them. And so I think people looking at the work now would really get it in a different kind of way and would say, whoa, look at, the, look at what this guy did.